when talking about Palestine, and especially when talking about Palestine from London, where you know, the, 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 the catastrophe of Palestine was officially launched and started. Um, I mean, we go back to 1948, you could go back to 1917 when the Balfour Declaration was, was actually made. But all in all, we're talking from the capital of the empire, which um, gave away Palestine uh, to the Jewish people, in my estimation, and I'm, yeah. I'd be fascinated to hear what you think, in order to, for Europe to wash its hand of the problem that it, that it created. And that is its extreme prejudice and hatred of Jews in Europe, Absolutely. which led to Nazism and then subsequently to the Holocaust. But washing its hands of this meant taking Jews and shipping them somewhere else. And Palestine happened to be, you know, the, the place where they ended. Um, how, you know, how does that figure in all of this? I think it's very poignant that we start at that point of our discussion because if you think about it, it didn't come off a one-off action. I mean, there's a whole movement that was built up behind that. That, as you mentioned, there's anti-Semitism in Europe, but behind that anti-Semitism was Christian Zionism, mm. which saw uh, the Jewish people playing a specific role for the Europeans as such and creating a frontier for them. Mm. So they served two purposes. One is, of course, to get rid of the Jews from Europe and ship them to somewhere else. But at the same time, they served a purpose where there could be a barrier against the so-called barbarians. Mm. So there could be a buffer for the white colonialist to move in. Mm. So we have to see it in these two hands because if we simply see it as one, uh, through one axis, then we simplify and we won't be able to understand the present support for Israel. Mm. So the continued support of Israel actually stems from its origin where they served a dual purpose. One, the, the hatred for the Jews and not wanting them to be part of European fabric and society, and therefore let's get rid of them. But also by get rid of, get rid, getting rid of them also meant having somebody out there doing your bidding for you, yeah. being the frontier wall mm. uh, for the colonialists then to move mm. in. And of course that has acted and played in different ways in the different past 75 years, really. The way that uh, uh, historians, especially the, the new historians, such as Ilan yeah. Pape and uh, Avi Schleim and, and others, um, uh, the way that they, 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 they drew the whole picture was that essentially this was a European project. Absolutely. And um, similar to the projects in South Africa, for instance, and in other places, this was, a, a, this was a, a, essentially a European project. And uh, Ilan Papi goes even further to, to call it a very racist Absolutely. project because it was a white sort of, sort of project. Yeah, I mean, Theodore Herschel wrote to Cecil Rhodes. Cecil mm. Rhodes, if people, uh, just to remind ourselves, is the colonialist in Southern Africa mm. and through him Rhodesia is named. Yeah. He writes to him a letter, and I, of course, paraphrase it to something like, I am writing to you, this is uh, Theodore Herschel writing mm. to Rhodes, saying, I'm writing to you because I know you're, you would understand my project, mm. you know, a colonialist project. You know, help us to establish a frontier for the Europeans. Mm. Uh, and, you know, of course, so that, that sort of fits in very well with academics, as you said, the new his Israeli historians. And, and they are very spot on to show that this is a colonialist project trying to help Europe expand its frontiers. And what happens is when direct colonialism ends in 47, 48, it's ironically at the same time, Israel then helps Europe in the post-colonial colonial reordering of itself, yeah. in which Europe still remains the superior vis-a-vis mm. -vis the rest. And again, it plays that pivotal role, and hence we see a continued support for Israel. How, I mean, Robert, particularly, you'll know about this because you're you know, campaigning for Palestine and such, but how is it that the mainstream and dominant narrative that is being pushed by media, by... Uh, governments, by politicians around the world, probably, um, regarding the situation. How do you go on about countering that if you were on, let's say, on the tube for 20 minutes and someone asks you what you did? How do you go on about explaining Palestine 
um, within a matter of, a, you know, a few seconds. How, how do you go on about that? Because, I mean, what I'm worried about is that the political project sure. that we speak mm. of was backed by uh, or continues to be backed by um, global media. I mean, you, you can't now uh, hope to get, you know, your version of the story, for instance, on the BBC or on Sky News or on Channel 4 or the such. It'll be a very, very difficult task. Mm. So how do you counter all that? I think the first thing that we should do is to work within our own communities. Mm. Um, I'm often surprised by how many supporters of Palestine um, don't look at the new historians. Mm. Don't look at the analysis about the Nakba. You know, we often have a tendency to take it for granted that, you know, 750,000 Palestinians were displaced without knowing, you know, the the design behind that, without knowing things like Plan, plan Dalet yeah. and, and the system. Many that, of them left thinking that they'd get back within a few hours. Exactly, exactly. So I think we start by educating our own communities. Mm. You know, we, we speak about BDS, but how many Palestine supporters know Yes. the three principles of BDS. Mm. Um, how many Palestine supporters conceptualize BDS through boycotting retailers mm. and not going to your local Starbucks or Pret? You know, BDS is much bigger than that. It's about differentiation. It's about looking at even existing European policy and encouraging our decision makers to follow what they've already signed up for. Mm. How, I mean, when, when you talk about BDS, how do you go on about convincing someone that not having that cup of coffee at Starbucks will make a difference. How, how, how do you convince someone, seriously? I mean, uh, what, for the past 20 years, we've been boycotting McDonald's, for instance. Yeah, that's yeah? right, uh, Coca-Cola. But, but, yeah, Coca <laughs> Coca uh, but, you know, we, we don't really see a dent financially or in terms of its public image. Well, well I think there's two, two aspects to that. I think we need to go slightly more nuanced, and I think Robert can help me with this as well, uh, is if we differentiate the sort of more politically active community across the board, Muslims and non-Muslims, mm. the civil society, you see they're very active about it. Mm. Unfortunately, within the Muslims, and I think we have to differentiate here Muslims, they are very weak to take it on board mm. for several reasons. One, they don't see it as a religious obligation. Uh, second, they don't think it's part of our tradition, right. uh, historical tradition. And th third, they think by spending, say, five pounds or 10 pounds, what difference is it going to yeah. make? So I think we need to tackle those three points. So let's have a look at the historical uh, position. We are very well aware that the Prophet ﷺ himself was boycotted against. You know, everybody knows that. Yeah. You know, the three years, uh, him and his banu Hashim and the clans um, in Mecca. But what we don't know, and very few people are aware of, that the Prophet ﷺ himself imposed boycott. Mm. And it was during the period of Tabuk. Yeah. When he went out at Tabuk expedition, yeah. three Sahabas remained behind, Kabi bin Malik, uh, Hilal, and Murara radiallahu mm. anhu. So those three stayed behind. And of course, there was a Munafiqin. When he returns back from Tabuk, the Munafiqin first come to seek forgiveness the and, 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 and the hypocrisy. Yeah, and, and, and then he says, fine, you know, Allah don't forgive you, don't worry about it, I take a pledge. But when these three come, he tells all the Sahabas to boycott them. Mm. No transactions with them and no talking to them. Mm. In fact, after 40 days, he tells his wives not to, to cohabit with them. Mm. And only after 50 days does he forgive them. Right. right. So there was a boycott campaign against, it was of course the uh, objectives were different, mm. but the principles are same. And more importantly than that was the second time is uh, the head of uh, Yamama mm. uh, converts to Islam. And then he goes to Mecca. And this was a time before Hudaybiyah and yeah. before the, the conquest of Mecca. Uh, and he realizes the animosity of the people of uh, Mecca. So he says, no wheat or grain will be sold to you. I'm not going to do it, right? right. And he goes to the prophet and the prophet doesn't say anything. Mm. When Hudaybiyah is signed, the Meccans come to the prophet saying, Hudaybiyah says you cannot boycott us. Mm. And it is only after Hudaybiyah that the boycott has been lifted. Yeah. So the Prophet Sallallahu himself and in his life, so Muslims need to understand this, yeah. that the boycott is part and fabric of our uh, principles and political tool mm. uh, in which we have, it has been used and we should use it. So that's the first thing. The second aspect is about the amount of money. Now, if, I mean, Robert will know here that, you know, five pounds you may not think is not much, but a bullet only cost a few pounds. Yeah. Imagine the tragedy if that your money goes to supporting buying that bullet, then you make, you know, t yeah. cry tears, yeah. right? And also beyond that, I think there's an ethical aspect, just the imagination that it's your funds that are helping occupation. Yeah. 
The amount is irrelevant here. True. It's the principle. True. But, but the principle. if I was to ask, if I was to ask, how would you portray Palestine today in the public conscience? Is it, is it essentially a, a human rights issue? Is it political? Is it something that needs to be done and solved from the political angle and you need to get governments to move on and the such? Is it religious? Is it, is it down to about faith, about you know, Muslims uh, versus mm. Jews or the such? I mean, what, what is it? How, how do you classify it so that, so that people could, you know, uh, could understand more about how, what, what kind of mechanisms they use? Well, I think, it's, I think it's all of the above. I think it's uh, both a religious and a humanitarian and a human rights issue. I think the trap that we often fall into- What's the easiest to talk about though? Humanitarian issue. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. But, but, and, uh, but the thing is a humanitarian issue. What, what you have to expand on this is it's a humanitarian crisis created by humans. Yeah. It's not a natural right. disaster. Right. Normally, human, you know, we've just had a tragic earthquake in uh, Turkey, Syria. That is a humanitarian issue which has been created by nature. Yes. In Palestine, it's being created by one group of people against another. True, true. And therefore, it, it is entangled with politics. So how do you describe, to, let's say, young campaigners in, in a university, how would, you, how would you show them? You know, how would you tell them that this is humanitarian, it's political, but it's also a little bit religious? How, how do you do that? I think you start from the beginning and the origins of Zionism. You work your way up to the Nakba and what happened in 67 as well. Mm. So the key historical events. And through the discourse, you also explain the salience of key religious places within Palestine, mm. like the Haram where Masjid al-Aqsa is and the Dome of the Rock is, the Ibrahimi Mosque and so on and so forth. And by framing it through the historical events, people will understand that today's developments are not occurring in a vacuum. Right. You know, the, the modus operandi of the Israeli state from its inception has been apartheid policies such as settlement expansion and ethnic cleansing. How do you find young people responding to the, the issue of Palestine, to the campaign of Palestine? I mean, in light of the, uh, the, the massive wave of, you know, pro-Israel, how, how do you get people to get engaged in, in a campaign for Palestine? I mean, I know, for instance, I know personally someone who in one of the demonstrations here in London against the Israeli attacks on yes. Gaza um, went back, uh, I mean, he was, he was on stage, he, sure. uh, he spoke and the such, and the very next day he was called in at his office, at the boss's office, and mm -hmm. told, listen, you know, you've been seen on Facebook and on YouTube and the such, and uh, if you want a serious career, then you need to stop that. It's a big, it's a big deal to, to work for Palestine, is it not? It, Oh. It is, Robert, go ahead. I mean, it is, I mean, we both, we can give a lot of examples as you, as you do even worse where people have been, we know, I, mean, I think, uh, uh, I think no point denying the NUS president uh, who's now yeah. actually- Shema Delali. Potential, potentially she might lose a position. Let's hope she stands up. Mm. But that is also emboldening people. What, what is happening, yes, a lot of people are concerned and a lot of people are worried, but they're now going equipped understanding the potential dangers. Mm. And what we happened in last Ramadan, when uh, Masjid Laksa was attacked, we had something like 185,000 people on the streets. Mm. For the first time in the past 25 years, I would say majority of people at that demonstration were young people. Yeah. So there was a shift, right? So despite the pressures, despite, if you like, almost the threats yeah. in inverted commas, yes. young people understand what is right and they have to stand up for justice. Mm. And I think that is something very, Encouraging. Do you think that that's partly a blowback because of the intensive media campaign against, you know, exposing the, the, the Palestinian narrative to the public? Do, do you think that that has something to do with it? I think the hypocrisy has, I think. I think, mm. it, they, I mean, you know, the people can be fooled for so long and they can be oppressed for so long and they, they say, you know, enough is enough. Mm. It's, it's like a pressure cooker. Right. They, they, you know, they blow it some stage and they'll, they'll, they'll try and do whatever is right and they're doing, politically, they, I think they're doing the right stuff by campaigning, lobbying, coming out on the streets, demonstrating, democratically exercising their right. Because on the one hand, day in and day out, we're being told we live in democracy, the freedom of speech, you can do whatever, you know, all these things are being drilled out and they think this is what makes us British. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, talk about Palestine, then it's no, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and the big hypocrisy we've had just recently is regarding um, 
uh, our uh, commentator match of the day. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Gary Lineker. Gary Lineker. Yeah. You know, where he was allowed to say whatever he liked against Qatar. Yeah. Uh, he can say whatever he likes about everybody else. Yeah. But as soon as he mentioned about the British government, yeah. no. But what happened was there was that reaction against the public when they realized that, you know, this is, there's a duplicity here at yeah. ACT. And there was that pressure then built up on BBC then to renege yeah. uh, their initial decision. I think similar stuff is happening in the Palestinian sector where we're having to, you know, get young people come out and, and speak their mind up. When we're talking about Palestine, we're talking about um, those who are, as we put it in Palestine proper, sure. or 1948, or Israel, yeah. you know? Um, those in Jerusalem, for instance, in uh, Yaffa and... Um, then the West Bank, sure. okay, Ramallah, Nablus. Mm. Then Gaza, yeah. okay, and we know what's happening in Gaza. And then you have the refugees. Refugees. Refugees, and then you have the diaspora. Yeah. The Shatat, yeah. okay. So you have essentially five sections of Palestinians, each of whom mm. has a unique case, because when you're talking about inside Israel, as they say, uh, you're talking about what's happening in Jerusalem, the mass, the, the enforced um, uh, evacuation of Palestinian f families, just like we saw in uh, Sheikh Jarrah and various other places in Silwan and the such, um, the West Bank and the kind of security liaison between the Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. and the Israelis. Gaza, we have now what? What's now? 15, 16, 17, years, yeah. almost 16 years, years. Yeah. of yeah. a blockade. I mean, the, the entire world has no recollection of a siege against two, two and a half million people in that tiny strip of land for almost two decades, whilst the world is just watching, absolutely watching. And then you have the refugees and those in Syria and Lebanon facing horrific treatment and discrimination and prejudice, and those in the diaspora who are yearning to go back, but can't. I mean, these are certainly stories that must, must, you know, grip someone's attention, someone's uh, sympathy, someone's, uh, I don't know, someone's uh, um, attention so that they, they you know, they, they organize, they campaign, they speak out. I think the important thing to to think about here is when you referred to the you know the the pro-Israeli lobby, you mentioned a massive wave. Yeah. Um. I I I disagree. I think it's a a very small wave with a very disproportionate impact. Mm. I think we have the massive wave, but we have mm -hmm. a much smaller impact. Very interesting. Mm. And I think. But the, why is that? Do you think? Why is that? I think that's because of the lack of compartmentalization of the solidarity movement. Mm. If you look at our solidarity movement, we have a number of organizations focused on very similar things. And you look at the pro-Israeli movement and you see camera will focus on campuses and the media. You'll see board of deputies will be the umbrella group for British mm. Jews. The Jewish Chronicle will provide a media outlet. You'll see Elnet, which will focus on delegations and many more. Mm. It's, it's our movement has failed to compartmentalize in a way where we have a UK lawyers for Israel, yeah. where we have an LNET to send politicians on delegations. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and maybe you can point to you know, the lack of, of funding, um, maybe you can point to the lack of resources, but I think it's a failure within the movement mm. to structure itself in a way that's conducive to impact. Mm. But surely, but surely, by the way, I mean, the, I mean, the fact you, you talk about a solidarity movement, the fact that there is a solidarity yeah. movement that's been going on for years. Sure. I mean, and now it's what, 30, 40 years. I, I, I heard from Jeremy Corbyn uh, once that uh, it started in some, some around the mid seventies. So it's, it's been around for over 40 years. Um, and that solidarity movement, bear, bear in mind, is um, a British-born movement in the heart of Britain where the, the creation of Israel was instigated, um, facing that kind of wave, be it small, but quite influential, impactful through the yeah. media. And it's still here. It's still here. And it's still it coming up with ideas. It's still growing. coming up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I agree with Robert in the, his analysis uh, of... Uh, the, the way the different uh, parts are working 
But I think we need to expand on a little bit as well that I think the majority of the civil society globally, not just Britain, I would mm. say in Western Europe in particular, even in America, are with the Palestinians. Yeah. Where we're missing out is the elites, mm. the government and the institution level. Now that is difficult to break because that is tied in with colonialism. Mm. That is tied in with Eurocentricism and this idea and notions of creating a new world order uh, which is trying to see Israel part and parcel of that. Yeah. Yeah? And therefore, I think we shouldn't be so despondent and think that there's something we lack or we are not doing things properly. It's just that the people we have to work with needs to then break into those arenas mm. and show them. Mm. But that will happen. And we have to remind, uh, Robert is very young here, me and you, I think we can remember South Africa. Yeah. yeah? yeah, yeah. Ronald Reagan called Mandela a terrorist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher said he Lima will never, never. ever trod, uh, you know, uh, in English he, land. Or and then he had to, she had to roll out a red carpet for it. Things change. And what changed it is the civil society's momentum and there comes a pivotal point mm. when the governments and the elites will have to listen. Mm. And I think we're not very far off in this country. Mm. You know, when we, we, we are the only organization in Britain who can, we, year in and year out, when we have to bring out 100,000 people on the yeah. streets. Yeah. Nobody yeah. can do that. Yeah. And that is for the cause of Palestine, yeah. right? And there are a lot of people um, th throughout the spectrum. And now we have in academia as well, a very growing section. Majority of trade unions in Britain will support the Palestinian cause. So the momentum is there. So I think we should be very positive about it. We, we shouldn't be complacent, definitely not complacent. Move that forward and make it very difficult for the politicians to be able to support Israelis. Yeah. And I think if we can get to that stage and we are getting there, because yes, if you think now from say at least 10 years ago, all of a sudden the left wing, as we were discussing earlier, the left wing of uh, political parties in Britain are also becoming more pro-Israelis, right. but they're having to do it behind the door, closed doors, yeah. not open doors, not before where the pro-Israeli supporters used to openly say what they were doing. But now they almost shy to do it. They have to give an excuse. Mm. You know, they have to use uh, covered languages. Yeah. And that in a way is exposing them. And that's the political project I think we should have this country to expose those people. You recently had the Aqsa week. That's right. And you've had, uh, this is what? Uh, which, which year, I mean? It's the third year uh, of Aqsa week. And Aqsa week is a one week of uh, <clears throat> dedicated towards highlighting the heritage, the culture, the love, uh, and the virtues of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Mm. So in that sense, it is reviving the Muslims' connection to Al-Aqsa. Right. And it coincides with the night of Al-Isra al mihraj on the yes. 27th of Rajab uh, every year. So this year we had 50 countries around the world participating. Wow. So that shows the level and we had, I mean, I can't give you the numbers, but we had it, uh, we had a hashtag called Love Aksa yes. to be used and it trended in South Africa and in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, so that's big. Yeah. Uh, and and we, as I say, you know, hundreds of organizations mm. participated. I know almost every Muslim school in South Africa participated yeah. with thousands of children. I'm sure many Arab countries as well. And many, uh, in fact, Iraq. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. I, 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 to be honest, I was being strange. facetious. No, no, but no honestly, strange. You know, Iraq. Me. That's fantastic. That's really good. And we had an official government uh, wow. saying, okay. you know, we support That's Africa. a little bit too much. Uh, but it's Turkey, okay. Turkey did as well. Yes. Turkey did. And of course, Palestine, both in the 47 and 67 um, area, uh, participated in it, supported by the major scholars and imams there. So it is growing. And when we need to make it global. Uh, and there's a sort of indicators where the Muslims are again reviving uh, their love for Al-Aqsa. And, you know, we talked about whether this is a political uh, issue or humanitarian issue or religious issue. I think for Muslims, this is all encompassing. Mm. For Muslims, we do not differentiate humanitarian, political. Yeah. Yeah? Islam and Muslims are everything. Yeah. Yeah, when we believe that, yeah, yeah. And, and therefore we have to see which part is humanitarian, which part is political. Without a political project, we will not be able to resolve the Palestinian issue. But in the immediate term, there is a humanitarian crisis, so we need to help the human take, take care of that into account. Of and of course, there's an Islamic dimension where there's, I mean, unfortunately for Muslims, if you look around the globe, Muslims are in problem. Mm. You know, the highest pro uh, refugee pro uh, problems in, uh, against Muslims. Yet the Palestinian problem stands out because it has, a, a th if you like, a faith dimension, yeah. particularly with, to do with Masjid Al-Aqsa. Yeah you know, the first Qibla, the site of Risal al-Mihraj, the land that Allah has blessed mm. for us. 
Mm-hmm. So that builds us that connection. And therefore, the Palestinian issue, unlike any other issue, has that uh, faith dimension in which we have to build upon. Um, Robert, in your dealings with uh, Parliament in Westminster and also um, with Brussels a little bit, do you see sort of a comparable rise or expanse in terms of those who are sympathetic to what you have to tell them? Do you see that there are more MPs, for instance, understanding that what's going on in Gaza is, for instance, unacceptable? I mean, I mean notwithstanding what, what uh, Ismail has just said, and I, I, I agree with absolutely, but Palestine is also the homeland and the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and so it must have you know, a very high value and esteem within the hearts of Christians around the world, at least, let's, let's just say. Do, do you see that kind of expanse in terms of public support correlating in, in, in the corridors of power? Definitely not. I think we are actually regressing mm. in the sense, and there's many reasons that you can point as to why that's happening. I think one thing that I was uh, looking at a few days ago is Labour Friends of Israel sent their largest delegation to Israel-Palestine wow. in the last decade. Wow. They sent that delegation a month ago. Wow. And if you look at that tour, where they went, who they met with, mm. they meet with intelligence chiefs, they go to the border towns on the Gaza Strip, um, they, they visit areas affected, quote-unquote, by... by um, what they, what they say is Hamas rockets, mm. and so on and so forth. So they are going on tours that are engineering a perception of the situation that is completely, completely inaccurate. And I'm misguided. guessing that there aren't similar tours done by the Palestinian or Arab or Muslim lobbies. Logistically, to... it's very difficult to get in. Mm. And that's one of the problems. And when these delegations go to Israel, invited by the LFI, they do go to the occupied territories oftentimes, mm-hmm. but they go directly to Ramallah and they meet with the leaders there. Yeah. And for anyone that's been to Ramallah, you can find, you know, Domino's Pizza, yeah. you can find yeah. a very- It's fairly gen- westernized. It's very westernized, very <coughs> gentrified. Yeah. It's almost a bubble within the occupied territories mm-hmm. that is completely disengaged from reality. But no meetings with, let's say, refugee camps, with- uh, No. Going- checkpoints or using the checkpoints and so forth. Yeah. That, that is true. But do you also find, Robert, that when you talk to the politicians privately, uh, not publicly, privately, then you get a completely different perspective. Because my experience, I don't, I don't know what your experience, I would really like to hear your experience as well, is I have actually met uh, conservative ministers uh, who privately uh, have said, you know, it has been very difficult to deal with this case issue and we sympathize, but we cannot do anything. I mean, some of them have gone as far as that. I don't know how, what your experience is because it's be very interesting. No, I, I completely agree. There's definitely a difference between what is said privately and, and in public. Yeah. I think for fear of you know, repression and for fear of ending up on the Daily Mail. Um, yeah, whatever. But, but the, the, <laughs> see what that tells you, for me, that tells you that there is a, there's a structure and there's a, either imaginary or real pressure on them because it could be both. Sometimes you imagine things and therefore you act in a certain way, especially politicians, they want to be PR and you know, they want to be, be seen to be doing the right thing yeah. rather than doing the right thing. Yeah. They just simply want to be seen to be doing the right thing. And therefore you have these politicians who are acting in a certain way, yeah. but their heart and mind is not there. Mm. You know, it has, provides a utility, it provides them with some advantage. You know, they think it might give them a good coverage in the media and therefore, you know, they won't be lambasted and that, that will help them win the election or whatever, you know. But they see there's an advantage in doing it, but they do not have belief in it. I have, a, I have met very few politicians, right, who are, maybe they won't want to talk to me, <laughs> but generally speaking, who are convinced that what they're doing is right for Israel. And I don't know whether you have who would say, you know, this is my ideological belief is that yes, uh, Israel has a right to take over Palestinian territory and they have a right to, to remain, uh, to co- carry on with their colonialism. Yeah, and I, I think especially the new generation of politicians are facing this problem more so than ever. Yeah. I think a decade ago when think tanks in Israel like the Rayu Institute mm. started to say BDS was the number one priority, mm. they fashioned the framework where because they were losing the grassroots and they were losing in many cases the left, yeah. they decided to create this legal framework through the IHRA, which even if an MP is pro-Palestine, he's limited 
in what he can say because of the IHRA and its, and its acceptance. So I think there's a difference between public and private, but even the pro-Palestine MPs now are shifting their discourse towards the center ground for fear of being called anti-Semitic. So they're being silenced, right? Yes. But, but the IHRA is also very interesting Anas, for me as well. If you think about it, what it's doing, it started off trying to say, we'll just try and stop any uh, attacks on Jews. And then it became on Israel and Zionism. But now it's attack it just recently last week we've had international israeli organizations who are now being told yeah. they cannot act because they're contravening the ihra definition so it's acting against the jewish people itself mm. right mm. so in a way this will also in all these things are at, at the moment it appears that they are being very successful like silencing everybody but if you think about it these are the kind of acts that doesn't pay dividends in the long run I know we have Palestinians haven't got that time in the, in, in the, on their side. The suffering is really acute. But we have to employ this kind of stuff and expose them to show that these kind of definitions... You, exist. you see, I mean, this is quite interesting because whilst we do find that, that particularly officials, MPs and... Mm. Uh, and the prob- I, I, I'll, t- I'll venture a guess and say that in Brussels, it's almost the same. Mm. I mean, you, you're seeing people who are either uh, hard on the left and therefore mm. they'll con- constantly um, say what they think in support of Palestine, but they're more and more isolated by the fact that the majority are sort of moving away towards the right or towards the middle ground, if you, if you may. But whilst we're seeing this happen, we're also seeing something quite interesting happening in America, whereby I recall very, very well, probably around 15, 16 years ago when I visited and I wanted to bring this up amongst a group of friends mm. who were in uh, congressmen and representatives' offices, and they said, no, absolutely no, do not bring this up at all. This is not something we talk about, especially in Congress or the House of Representatives. We simply do not. It was a no-no. But now, I mean, especially after what happened in Jerusalem, in Al-Quds yeah. last year, in uh, Sheikh Jarrah, we found people from the floor of Congress yeah, speaking. actually speak out against Israel. I mean, and for the very first time, yeah. there being a vote whereby some, you know, a number of, of, of congressmen and women actually, you know, votes in support of a motion condemning Israel. So, I mean, this is, this is something which is quite interesting, you know? It definitely is. And it's happening in tandem with this growing schism within the Jewish community mm-hmm. that's playing out mainly in America. Yeah. If you look at the solidarity movement as a whole, some of the biggest organizations are based in America and uh, Jewish organizations, yes. like Jewish Voice for Peace, yeah. If Not Now, and so on and so forth. And I think where we go from here, especially in this new government, is very interesting because mm. the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs, one of you the ministries- the Israeli government? Yes. yes. The Ministry of Diaspora Affairs within the Israeli government has just renamed itself to the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs and the struggle against anti-Semitism. And they've changed their purview in order to tackle some of the issues relating to the, the schism within the Jewish community. Interesting. Um, because they see it as one of the main threats moving forward. Wow. So I think, you know, the support in America is great, but a lot of it has to be put down to the, to the power of the, the, the Jewish movement over, over there, as well as the Palestine Solidarity Movement. It's, it's quite, it fascinates me how, I mean, <laughs> how wrong, but also how effective this campaign by Zionists to tie the attack on Israel with anti-Semitism. Yes, I this mean, conflation yeah, but, but, is, is, is quite f- fascinating because it's absurd. I mean, when you, when you look at it, when you examine it, mm. even superficially, you find out how ridiculous it is. But at the same time, the campaign itself was immensely effective. But it was, the, Zionism was born out of uh, a political project trying to marry uh, Judaism with Zionism, yeah. right at the very beginning and yeah. the outset. The rabbis in Europe totally rejected Zionism. Yeah. yeah. But it was only when- In America, America was, the rabbis rejected Zionism, absolutely. absolutely. Even the British Board of Deputies, if I, my memory serves me right, until 1937, yeah. would not accept Zionism. And they, re- they, they actually, um, it was uh, Rabbi David Weiss yes. from the Natori Karta, who, who uh, on one of my programs in the past, said that the rabbis of New York mm. um, actually call Zionism an infidel 
absolutely. Movement. Yeah. It was so absolutely. Rabbi Sonofil of Austria, in, this is going back in the early 30s, considered Zionism emerging from the side of pollution and Satan. Wow. So that's how, how uh, sort of, if you like, different Zionism and Judaism are. But they married that together, and it is that that is now fragmenting, if you like. So because of the Holocaust, all those things were then sort of plastered over and that is now re-emerging when the new community and the new, I mean, everybody's human being and they can see, every human yeah. being can see what is happening there, mm. you know? And sometimes you, you, your alliances go so far because of your faith, the same color, same culture, language, but then you have to also stand up and say, you know what, this is wrong. And that is what is happening to the yeah. Jewish community. In fact, uh, the attack in Huara recently yes. by the extremists are referred as pogroms. By what? Jewish by newspapers. By Jewish newspapers, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The Haaretz called it the neo-Nazi movement. Yeah. Haaretz, I mean, Israeli newspaper calling this neo-Nazi, Yeah. right? So you have this uh, schism, as you mentioned, emerging. And that is something we have to now use to highlight and, and then use it against politicians and he's saying, you have Israelis and Jews saying this, how can you then support it? On but, what basis? But let's, not forget, but let's not forget that part of that is also down to the, I mean, the incredible scenes and shows of courage shown by Palestinians in, absolutely, like Sheikh Jarrah, yeah. like in the Aqsa Mosque, like in face of uh, you know of, of, of the armed raids and uh, and the killings and the like and the evacuations, um, surely we are now seeing a new generation of Palestinians. I recall when uh, uh, when uh, uh, there was the Janine massacre in two thousand and two. Yeah. And I recall um, one of the producers of the BBC giving me a call and saying, are there any Palestinians who can come on the program and, 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 and speak? And we couldn't find anyone at the time who could speak proper English without the use of an interpreter. Um, but now we have scores of uh, social media influencers, of uh, young uh, men and women, who are able to, um, to actually put into very smart and clever, intelligent phrases, uh, you know, the situation that they face. Sure, surely that's had some, some, some impact. I think it's had a huge impact. I think if you go back to May 2021, the impact of the al Qad family on yes. social media was mm. extremely seismic. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of people engaged with Palestine through the words of Muhammad and Mona al Qad. Sure. Mm. Um, I do think, however, that then there has to be a caveat here, which is if you look at the West Bank, there, there is still this Oslo paradigm in place, yeah. which means in the words of General Dighton and going back to some of the philosophy behind Oslo, Palestinians on the main are very lone dependent and disengaged from resistance. Mm. And when they are engaged in resistance, such as groups like the Lion's Den, mm. their own leaders will engage in authoritarianism and arrest them. And I find that a very strange paradox um, that I've been trying to kind of wrap my head around, which is when, you know, raids and massacres happen in cities like Nablus and Janin, official authorities in the West Bank will, will condemn those massacres, yeah. but two days later arrest the very people from the groups yeah. who have been targeted. Yeah. So to get our house in order is, is, is extremely important. Mm. and to protect civilian journalists mm. like Muna Muhammad mm. and Adnan Bark and, and yes. others is, is also exceptionally salient. Mm. But this is, I think, in a way, if you like, the unique, and I use the word unique in a negative sense here, yeah, of Israel's colonialism. It is so uh, refined that it has managed to control so many different aspects, in fact, every aspect of Palestinian life, uh, political or social. Um, but what has happened over the years, and Palestinian resistance was institutionalized through political bodies, either be Hamas or, or Fatah, right? We have, what we're seeing now in the past, is particularly three years, I would say, not going even further than that, I hope it progresses, that it is now being dismantled and it's going down to the civil society. So what you have is civil disobedience. And I think that's a good thing where you don't have an institute and an organization, because if you have civil disobedience, then they can have their own independent political project rather than have institutionalized organization 
uh, which speaks for the Palestinian people. Because when you're occupied, you don't want somebody to speak for you. You want you, you want the whole mass people to work. And if you think of the ANC, that's how the ANC got the political project as well as acceptance globally. Yeah. Because they weren't associated with a, a party, a group, yeah. right? They were a resistance people. And that's what the Palestinians, I think, need. And I think the fact that within the Palestinians, uh, you can't trust the present, if you like, the organized uh, political sectors, uh, factions, uh, to even protect its own people. Sooner or later, the people will know that they'll have to do something against them as well. And they don't have a political mandate. They're there because Israel wants them to be yeah. there yeah. and because the West wants, to, wants, yeah. to, wants them to be there. And that's a sad reality. But unfortunately, that reality is a very acute in the case of Israel-Palestine. Uh, but that has always been the case wherever colonialism has taken place. Mm. Wherever you look throughout the history of colonialism, they always manage to bring up a group who will be a proxy for the occupier, for the colonizer to manage th the population. Mm. And that is also what's happening in Palestine. So I think we have to look at the whole structure of colonialism yeah. and how that operates and, and then use that and learn from the history and see how that, you know, organizations move forward. Uh, tell me about BDS. How, how widespread is it? Be? How many countries, let's say, are engaged in BDS? I mean, how, because recently we had a court case that, that vindicated BDS, that actually yes. found that banning BDS wasn't legal. Yes. Is this so, in the UK? The court? This is in the UK, yes. Okay, so I mean, this, this, is this is a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, absolutely. And so this was counted as a victory for the idea of BDS. But in reality, I mean, because I, I as, as Ismaili put it, I, re, I recall very, very well and very fondly, I have to mm. say, uh, my very first um, political actual engagement um, back in the 1986, 1987, um, when we were on the streets, I, at the time I was in Manchester, and um, the NUS, the National Union of Students, was absolutely behind the, uh, the, uh, the uh, anti-apartheid mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the kind of, and, and that had a, an immense impact, not only on, in terms of the public opinion of what was happening in South Africa. And I have to say, at the time, there were many within British society mm -hmm. that wouldn't hear a bad word against the whites in, in South Africa. It was seen as an extension of Britain. It was, yes. uh, and it was the savages that were creating the trouble and the problem. If, if they only worked in the fields as they were told, they would live happily and they would be you know, well fed and the such. Um, but the impact of those demonstrations by young British men and women on creating a particular image of the apartheid regime, which was then followed by the boycotts of the cricket teams and, yes. and, and the such. And that in a way, even when, you know, re, you read the autobiographies of the likes of uh, Frank de Klerk for instance, mm. and the such former presidents of South Africa, they'll tell you that, that that was, you know, a very, very hefty blow to the entire system. So what are we talking about now? How big, how influential, how expansive is the BDS movement? I think on the level of personal consumption, it's massive. I think most supporters of Palestine will be consciously aware of what they consume. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the level of bureaucracy and how we work within administrations, we are less sophisticated. Um, and just to bring in an anecdote, on the 1st of December, 2019, I was at a protest, an incredibly small protest outside a building in Camden, in Camden and the building was owned by Camden Council. And the reason we were protesting was because Regavim were yes. invited to speak. I remember. And they were invited by the UK Lawyers for Israel. Yeah. And for those that don't know Regavim, they work within the Israeli judicial system to you know, <laughs> sponsor the house demolition of quote unquote illegal structures within Area C and in other parts of the West Bank. Yeah. And I, I found myself thinking at the time, how has this event managed to take place. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a labor labor council, it's a council building, and an organization that is based on fascist ideas yeah. that is founded by Smotrich, mm. who is now the Minister of Finance and a minister in the def Defense Ministry, 
who called for the erasure of Hawara, yes. this event managed to take place. So I think, you know, we are not working effectively in the system mm. for us to cancel those types of events, but at the level of personal consumption, BDS is massive. Mm. And most Palestine supporters I've met will be consciously aware of, you know, buying goods from occupied territories or buying goods from Israel, so on and so forth. How important was the uh, amnesty report that mentioned that Israel was an apartheid state? It was good. It was good that it came out, uh, but it was very late. I mean, all of us knew that, you know, Israel is... Of course. But the fact that uh, Western Institute... Arguably before yeah. amnesty was bit slim. Yes. In, in Israel, yeah. the yes. Israeli yeah. human rights organization Absolutely. that's actually yeah. call, call, called call, call, call. Israel an apartheid Absolutely. State. But going back to the BDS, <clears throat> I think there's two things we have to think about here. The reason BDS has become a political to, uh, sort of hot potato, if you like, is because it's very effective, as you say, at social level. And the fact that they have to legislate mm. is an indication of how effective it is. If it wasn't effective, they won't have to legislate. Uh, I mean, Netanyahu in the past was known to be said that the greatest danger Israel faces is from BDS, yeah. right? Uh, so yes, it's very effective. We are sort of just to uh, expand on that, in Ramadan we do boycott Israeli dates. Yeah. And that is huge. Uh, we've had one company uh, go bankrupt. Uh, we have now Israeli companies trying to mix their products so that they can say mixed yeah. uh, produce. Yeah. Uh, and they're using all these tactics. Mm. So that comes from the consumer who's, as you say, you know, very, becoming very ethical. What you're right as well is, Robert, is to work with institutions and organization. But even there, I mean, Cambridge University stopped the uh, uh, ambassador speaking at the University of Cambridge, right. never heard of. You have now major events taking place where you have walkouts and so forth. So we are building in that. And they don't watch, you're very young, but go back 25 years ago, then the Zionist movement and the pro-Israeli lobby had an open field in Britain. They could do whatever they like, no more. Mm. You know? yeah. They have battles coming up. Yeah. And that is the positive sign. Young people like yourself, you know, who go to these demonstrations. Arrest you know? warrants against uh, Israeli officials. Uh, absolutely. Siki Livni uh, and, uh, 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 what's his name? The, uh, I forget the, the general. The defense uh, ministers, yeah. Uh, yeah. So those kind of stuff yeah. make, makes a change. And they have to use the back door to, to, to be able to get <clears> away with it. So the exposure is good. Uh, we need more. I absolutely agree with you, Robert, that we need to be much more coordinated and you know, campaign for every little thing. That, that Israeli, pro-Israeli lobby is trying to justify mm. the, the occupation and colonialism. But I think we're getting there and, and we should carry on. And we should encourage more people to do it. The situation in Gaza is, what's, what's, I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd. It's absolutely absurd. I mean, me just talking about it, just saying yeah. that this strip of land with two and a half million people trapped inside has been under siege by the Israeli authorities for the past since 2000 and what, seven? seven. Yeah. Since 2007, that's 16 years. I mean, I, I can't even believe that I'm uttering these words. And we're talking about the 21st century where human rights, freedoms are sacrosanct. Mm. What's going on? What, what is the situation? How, you know, how do we deal with it? How do you tell, I mean, if, if we were to, to stop anyone, I would assume, I, I, you know, I'm, maybe I'm thinking too um, optimistically, but if, I would assume that if I was to stop anyone on the street today and say, listen, there are two and a half million people who have been absolutely isolated from the entire world and trapped in an open air prison for 17 years. How do you feel about that? I would guarantee that 99.9% .9 of people, regardless of faith, yes. regardless of culture, regardless of ethnicity, would say that is absolutely unacceptable. Why then is it happening? Why is it happening? It's because the powers to be are allowing it to happen. I mean, that's why it's happening. Uh, most, and, the, and here there's two parts. It's not just government, but international instruments like United Nations and Geneva Convention, I think they have um, undermined the Palestinian cause. Mm. And maybe sometimes we rely too much on them to be able to do something. Uh, but it's also, for me, it says several stuff. It shows the resistance of the Palestinian I mean, uh, if you recall, I think about 10 years ago, uh, one of the walls was broken down or blown up. Yes. Right? Yes. And there was an interview, and it will stay with me till the days I pass away. There was one young chap who had gone towards the Egyptian site. Yeah. 
uh, and who was being interviewed by Al Jazeera mm -hmm. and say, what are you going to do? And he says, I'm going back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and, and you instead think- Instead of fleeing and running instead away. Instead of fleeing or running away. And you, I, I've heard recently that sort of half the populations in the Middle East want to emigrate, yeah. right? But here it's are people- It's only Gaza who, who want to yeah, go back. They, yeah. they understand their rights. They, yeah. they, they know that that is resistance and they're paying a very high price. But we need to, you know, show this up to the world society, the hypocrisy of the West. Yeah. You know, the hypocrisy mm -hmm. is just, I mean, I can't, can't use the stronger words. You know, maybe we, we haven't got enough words to describe yeah. what is happening yeah. really. You know, language restricting us to do exactly the suffering of the Palestinians. And more than that is our indifference in a way, all of us, yeah. that the fact that we're not doing enough for the people of Gaza, you know, it's something- it's, it's Another shocking. part of the world that isn't doing enough for, yes. for, for Palestine and Gaza is obviously the Arab and Muslim worlds. I mean, there's plenty of public support. Sure. And in fact, if anything, the normalization process mm. um, absolutely crashed at the rocks of public opinion. And we saw what happened in Qatar in the World yes, Cup. Absolutely. Um, you know, you see it on every single street um, in, throughout the Arab and Muslim world. But then you have the official positions, the governments and states. But that's government to government. I don't know what Robert wants to expand on this, but what, what is happening here is Israel, in a way, supporting those states, either by selling them arms, yep. technology, equipment, so that they can be repressive, mm. right? Uh, and the second extent is then you have the superpowers of the world and the Western countries who want Israel to succeed, telling, putting pressure on these governments that, yes, normalize your relationship. Mm. But they're doing it at the expense of not their own moral and ethics, but they're doing it at the expense of disenfranchising their own people. Yeah, exactly. They're putting themselves in danger. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's exactly. a short-termism. Mm. And, and that is, you know, in a way where this ends up, we don't know, but there's no political th thought behind these leaders yeah. of, of what their right is, what should be good for them, their people and the region. Yeah. And the globe really in a way to bring about justice for the Palestinians is good for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, maybe there'll be losers who are making a lot of money and selling arms. Yes, mm. but the rest of the world will be a much better place. Yeah. Done. I think it's a, mean, a means for a lot of these governments which are authoritarian already to fulfill their geopolitical ambitions. You know, I, I heard chatter about Western Sahara being on the table vis-a-vis -vis Morocco's decision to normalize. Mm. And one of the, the videos that really kind of exemplified this stark reality was there was a protest against normalization in Morocco, in one of the cities. Mm. And the Moroccan police were savagely beating the protesters. Yeah. As if support for Palestine is something completely alien to Moroccan mm. society. Yeah. So we're in, a, we're in a kind of status quo right now, as Ismail was saying, where this is really the leadership. Yeah. This is really le the leadership, not the people. Mm. And I think the World Cup definitely showed how strong support for Palestine was. Yeah. Um, and I th I, to be honest, I think that that's across, across, across the globe. Yes. I think that yes. is, um, you know, when I, when I travel to various countries like Malaysia, like uh, Australia even, New Zealand, uh, you find ordinary people coming and, and reacting like ordinary people do yes. to, like I said, the story yeah. of two and a half million people trapped for 17 years. Yes. Uh, you know, in a place called Gaza. And, you know, they come out and they respond and say, this is unacceptable. Any human being with the right sense who is not tainted and hasn't got a, a personal gain will automatically side with the Palestinians. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, you don't have to be a Muslim. You don't have to be academic. You, don't, you just have to be a human being. Yeah. You know, to, to allow one group of people to oppress another group of people simply because the others are thought to be more superior than yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just doesn't add up. No human being will accept that. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, we have also got, there's two things that I think we need to mention. One is we shouldn't also forget the sacrifice given by ordinary young Europeans and Americans. Yes. This year is 20 years to Rachel Corey. Rachel Corey. Today is 20 Absolutely. years yep. uh, when she was killed. Yeah. Uh, we've got Tom Handel from yes. England yes. Uh, who was yes. also yes. killed. And these people, are, you know, th their sacrifices are not forgotten. Absolutely. And, and they're sure. building, and in the, with the loss of their lives, they're building so much uh, goodwill yeah. Yeah. for 
for justice, yeah. for humanity uh, to, to succeed. And, and that gives us some sort of hope for the Palestinians as well, that, you know, things are not all lost. And we need more of them. And, and we need to build them. As, as we're saying, you know, the Palestinian cause for any individual with simple, who's morally rightly oriented as a human being, will support the Palestinians. And that hopefully gives us some sort of hope that things will change. Fantastic. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> Jabs, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.